Mark this, Son of God loved you and gave himself for you. That's not in the book of Mark. This is. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do what he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have them release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall we do with this man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, they delivered him up to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him with a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled the passerby, Simon of Serene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with mirth, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what it should take. And it was about the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him, one to another, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we might see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land up until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elio, Elio, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him, saying, 
gave it him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the t- of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw, saw that in this way, he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on a dis- from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up from Jerusalem. Verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud And taking him down, wrapped him in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. Help me, Holy Spirit. December the 29th, 1876, a passenger train, the Pacific Express, was struggling along in a blinding snowstorm. It was already about three hours late, and it was a Friday afternoon. Eleven coaches being pulled by two engines were creeping through huge snowdrifts, approaching Asperta, Ohio, passing over a trestle bridge that was spanning a river, the first engine reached solid ground on the other side, but everything else plummeted 20 meters into the ravine below, into icy water in the river. Later, it was determined that the floodwaters had weakened that bridge. Five minutes after the train had tumbled down, fire broke out fanned by gale-like winds, the wooden coaches were ablaze. On board that train was the evangelist, singer, hymn writer, Philip Bliss, and his wife, Lucy. Philip Bliss survived the crash, only to scramble back in through the broken window to try and rescue his wife, Lucy, who was pinned down by the ironwork of the seats. And there, he bravely remained at her side, trying to pull her out while the flames engulfed them both. All that remained was a charred mass. No trace of their bodies were ever found. For days, it wasn't known who was amongst the dead. There'd been no passenger list. But it was tabulated that out of 160 passengers, 92 lost their lives in that fateful Friday afternoon. The Blisses were survived by two sons, George and Philip, then age four and one, respectively. Philip Bliss was 38 years old when he died in that horrific way. Now, why am I telling you the story of that tragedy? Bliss was a singer, songwriter, evangelist, and a passion for souls. And he wrote over 300 hymns. One of the last hymns he wrote was Man of Sorrows that we just sang. Those that know this hymn probably sang it by a different tune. 
man of sorrows. What a name. For the son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless lamb of God was he for redemption. Can it be? Hallelujah. What a savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a savior. And then when he comes, a glorious king, to his kingdom, us to bring. Then anew, this song will sing. Hallelujah. What a savior. You know, my intention is this morning to bring and present to you this savior hanging on a Roman cross, lifted up. And he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. And when Jesus died on that fateful Friday 2,000 years ago, after he breathed his last, he plunged not into a ravine, not into an icy river, but he plunged into Hades itself, securing release for every Old Testament saint that put their trust in Jesus, getting the keys of, of death and hell from Satan, procuring your freedom and my freedom. Hallelujah. What a savior. Well, the year is AD 30 in the Jewish month of Nisan. And we're in the final week of Jesus' life, indeed the final day of Jesus' life and his earthly ministry. And it's all building up into an event that will have a cataclysmic uh, impact upon the whole of history, upon the whole of time, and upon eternity, and upon every spiritual force that has ever been, that inhabits heaven and inhabits hell. And it all plays out in a city called Jerusalem. A city swollen in numbers because of the Passover feast. Thousands had come in to celebrate the Passover. Early Friday morning, the religious power brokers met to discuss what they would do with this man that they called the Christ. They wanted him crucified. But they didn't have the authority to do that, not on the charges of being the Son of God, of calling himself the Son of God. Only the governor in charge of Palestine could sign his death warrant. And the charge of blasphemy was not enough to secure that death. And so they had to amend that charge to sedition against the Roman emperor. Caesar is Lord. So they bind him and take him over to the governor, Pontius Pilate. In verse 2, we read this. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you've said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. And Pilate stares at this man. And he's amazed by him. And in the unfolding drama of world redemption, Jesus Christ stands center stage, hands bound, accusations flying at him from every quarter. But Jesus... He's eloquent in his silence before the governor. He's fascinated by this man. Pontius Pilate. Oh, this morning, look around you. Can you see any familiar faces in the crowd? Wagging their fingers, accusing him. Because you were there. I was there. 
God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why was I born this way? Why did I come into this particular family? God, answer me. If you love me, Jesus, why? Jesus is eloquent in his silence. A scourging was customary before a Roman crucifixion. The whip was made up of a robust stanza of leather plaited together with pieces of sharp bone and metal. And for a, Jew, uh, for a Roman execution, there was no restriction in the number of lashes. We know that the Jews only had 30. They allowed 30 lashes. And it would have taken great lumps of flesh from the back of the one that was being flogged. And it would have left the prisoner, if not unconscious, then exhausted and filled with pain. Isaiah, hundreds of years before, prophesying, says this, I gave my back to those who strike me. I gave my cheeks to those that plucked my beard. I didn't cover my face from humiliation and spitting. A couple of chapters later, Isaiah speaks again of the Savior. In Isaiah chapter 3, we read these incredible words. By his stripes, those lashes on his back, by his stripes, we are healed. In other words, those bleeding gashes on the back of Jesus were cured for us, our healing. Some years ago when I was living in Devon, we used to meet periodically in the house of a friend, a good friend of mine. He was a dentist from Mottery St. Mary. He, he worked two days a week in Exeter Prison, and that was enough wages for him to just pass to the church in Ottery St. Mary. And we used to meet as leaders, and, and, and we'd encourage each other, prophesy over each other. And I remember one day he brought a, a, an incredible prophetic word over me. And he said this, Stephen, God calls you by name, by the way. Stephen, God wants you to listen to your wife. <laughs> Profound. Oh. Actually, Sean likes to remind me of that word from time to time. <laughs> My point is this. On the morning of the trial, Pontius Pilate's wife sent him an urgent message. She said, I I've had a dream, more of a nightmare. It's troubling me. Do not have anything to do with this man. But Pilate ignored his wife. You should always listen to your wife, man. And he condemned Jesus Christ to death. He made his own name infamous by doing that. You know, Pilate's wife was the only person ever recorded who spoke up against the decision to crucify Jesus Christ. Listen to your wife. Pilate, having made that decision, he got in front of the crowd with a bowl of water. There he washed his hands absolving him of any guilt. It was a futile attempt. He said in Matthew 27, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Now, during, the import, during a, a great feast, it was customary for the governor to release one of the Jewish prisoners that were held. And so there's Barabbas, a murderer in the insurrection, and Jesus. And Pilate hopes they'll shout for Jesus because he knows he's an innocent man. But stirred up by the religious leaders, the crowd shout for Barabbas. What shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him. They cry. Look around in that angry crowd, jeering crowd. Look at the faces, because you were there, and I was there, shouting for Barabbas. 
And then they scourge Jesus. And you know what? That, that word, that word scourge, cannot carry the reality of that incredible torture. The condemned man had to be flogged before any Roman execution. Only women and Roman senators were actually exempt. Stripped of his clothing, Jesus' hands tied in front of him. And from his ankles right up to his neck, flogged either by two soldiers or one in alternating position. And as I said, we don't know if the lashes were 39 in accordance with Jewish law, or did they go over and above that? But a whole lot of soldiers now gather around this faint, bleeding man, a man in severe pain, blood trickling down his, his shoulders, right down to his legs. And they roughly place a scarlet robe on him, forcing it down into his shoulders. They place a reed in his right hand, the scepter of a fool. And there they mock him. Hail, king of the Jews! They strike him with their hands. They pull out his beard. They spit in his face. They weave a crown made of thorns that are really industrial strength and length. And they not only put it down onto his head, but they force it down. And then they beat him over his head until those thorns go through his skin through his hair into his scalp, driven right into his skull. If you suffer from any mental health issues, Jesus was tormented, tortured, there in his skull, you can be set free because Jesus paid the price. Oh, then Jesus is made to carry this cross to the place of execution which was outside of Jerusalem. He's so weakened. He tries, but he fails. He falls down. And they, and they call, hey, you. Me? Carry his cross. And there we have this man, Simon from Cyrene. Cyrene is modern-day Libya, by the way. He was in Jerusalem for the feast with his two sons, Rufus and Alexander. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's speculated that Rufus was the one that was mentioned by Paul in his greetings to the, to the letter of Rome. And he calls him Rufus, chosen by the Lord, whose mother has been a mother to me too. My point is, carrying the cross of Jesus so affected this man's life. He carried his own cross for the rest of his life, passing his faith on to the next generation. He submits his whole life to Jesus at the cross. You know, Jesus said this, if any man, any woman, would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. They led him away to a hill outside of the city wall called Golgotha place of a skull. It actually looks like a skull. In the Latin, it's Calvary. Oh, what a wonderful name, Calvary. And there, the king of life. There, the king of love. There, the king of righteousness. The creator of everything is crucified on a wooden cross. Oh, they take away now, they, they put back his seamless robe, this white seamless robe, they, they rip it back off him, 
and there at his feet, Roman soldiers cast lots, dice. Who's going to have it? Well, we don't, want to, we don't want to tear it in pieces. It's too good for that. Let's throw dice for it, whoever gets the highest number. You know, I remember my grandmother telling me, you know, never gamble. Never. It, it, she said, it's, it's beyond stupid anyway to gamble. But that's what they did at the feet of Jesus. They gambled for his clothes. Amongst it, amongst the Jews, there was also a divine curse adding to the, the human scandal. Whoever hangs on a tree is cursed by God. We read it in Deuteronomy 21. Mark records for us it was the third hour when they crucified him. Mark 15, 25. That is 9 a.m. And Pilate orders sign to be put over his head. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, passes by. <laughs> they ridiculed him. You destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. You can't even get down off the cross. Sort of a messiah are you. Save yourself. The soldiers also mocked him. The chief priests and the scribes, the religious leaders, those that the people were supposed to look up to. He saved others. <laughs> he cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down. Then we'll believe him. And then they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. Matthew records that in chapter 27. But mid-afternoon, three hours later, darkness covers the whole of that land. It's black. Until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Eli, oh, Eli, oh, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words at the beginning of the, the exact phrase that's in Psalm 22 in the Old Testament, which actually begins with despair, but actually finishes up with great triumph. There is a God forsakenness at the cross of Jesus Christ. But thank God, the rejection that he felt, though severe, was never final. He would later say to, to the Father, into your hands, I submit my spirit. According to Mark, he endured the torment and pain of crucifixion for six long hours. From the third hour, 9 a.m., until the time of his death in the ninth hour, corresponding to 3, 3 p.m. Then Matthew says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. John, looking from a different perspective, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At this very moment, remember Jesus is facing the temple as he's being crucified. At that very moment, the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. We know in Solomon's temple, it was three cubits long. Herod building his temple, built it higher, thicker. That was four cubits long, 60 foot or 18 meters in length, and it was four inches or 10 centimeters thick. This thick veil was fashioned from blue, purple, and scarlet material twisted in fine linen. But when Jesus died, that temple veil was just torn in two, never to be repaired again. God moved out of the temple 
He never wanted to dwell in a temple made with hands. God's intention is to dwell inside you and inside me and inside the corporate body of Christians. In a sense, that veil was symbolic of Christ's body himself. Read that in John. He was the high priest, allowing us to come into the Holy of Holies through his body. That is the veil. Pontius Pilate now orders the legs of all those that are crucified be broken, thus speeding up their death. After breaking the legs of the two thieves, the soldiers decide not to break the legs of Jesus. Instead, a soldier picks up his spear and he lunges it into Jesus' side. And I poured blood and water, water from uh, the pericardium as his heart had been broken, thus fulfilling a prophecy that was in Psalm 34, verse 20. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Well, Joseph of Arimathea, this bold man, he asks for the body of Jesus. He's granted, and, and they take Jesus down. And he's placed within his own tomb. Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Pilate orders guards outside the tomb and they order a great big stone to be rolled so that nobody could steal the body of Jesus. John MacArthur says this, and I quote, the crucifixion of Christ was also the greatest act of divine justice ever carried out. And though murdered unjustly by men whose intentions was only evil, Jesus the Christ willingly became an atonement for the sins of the world. Your sins, my sins. He died for you and he died for me. He became sin so that we might be might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He was numbered as one of the, the sinners, the transgressors, condemned to bear the curse of God without an advocate. You know what we deserve? We deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the judgment of God. We've sinned. He didn't. But our greatest need, your greatest need, my greatest need today is forgiveness and the grace of God. He died to make that forgiveness possible. Christ bridged that gap between God and man on that cross, on that Friday that we now call Good Friday. You know, faith isn't just an idea, a nice idea. It's the conviction of our hearts and it's the commitment of our lives to Jesus Christ. One more short story that I might bring a point. In 586 BC, in the reign of, in the reign of Jehoiakim of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar raided Jerusalem and brought it under Babylonian rule. He carried some of the, the leaders, the, the nobles, back into Babylon. And a prophet remained, witnessing the destruction of Jerusalem. The temple burned, the place smashed, it, it looked dreadful. The remainder of the people were taken captive. But Jeremiah the prophet lived during all this, these historic events. He stayed in Judah with some of the poorer people that the Babylonians rejected. And he saw this proud Jerusalem, this beautiful place reduced to ashes. 
And you know, in, in the book of Lamentation, he records what he sees and he records how he feels. And he laments the total indifference of the people who pass by without saying a word. Jerusalem had fallen because of the sin and the indifference towards God. And he says to these people, and you know, we can fit these words into lots of other situations and scenarios. And I want to apply them to the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus today. He says this, is it, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by, to see Jerusalem in such a state? I don't want to use these words. Is it nothing to you, all you who witness the crucifixion of Jesus? Is it nothing to you? Has it not affected your life to the extent that you're a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ yet? Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you're not in a relationship with Jesus. You haven't asked him for forgiveness of your sins. You haven't asked him to come in and be the boss of your life. Then you stand on the outside, alienated from God. But there's a way made through the blood and the body of Christ, for you to be a friend of God. But I want to bring a challenge to us as Christians when we look at the state of our nation. Sin abounding. It's getting more like Sodom and Gomorrah every day. LGBT people just not content with their own, um, whether they're a boy or whether they're a girl, they want to change. What is that about? I want to tell you, it is sinful. It is not right. Because we're made in the image of God. And we should delight in what God and who God has made us. Is it nothing to you? He who pass by, that we read the newspapers, we see what's happening on the news. Does it not make us indifferent? Or does it drive us to our knees in prayer, crying out for the mercy of God? Is it nothing to you? I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes for a few moments. I just want to bring you this appeal. If I don't, I would be negligent in doing my duty as a preacher of the gospel. If you are not a Christian, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your own Lord, and your own savior, I'm giving you the opportunity. Now, I'm challenging you. The Bible says you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. If you wish to become a Christian today, I just want you to raise your hand right where you are. Just indicate to me that you want Jesus to be part of your life. you're not a Christian and you want to be. It's the most important decision you will ever make because your eternal destiny depends on whether you belong to Jesus or whether you don't. So after this life, there is a heaven to enter and there's a hell to shun. What would it be for you? I'd like you to mull over these things for the rest of the day. And if you want to receive Jesus to come into your life, you want to make that decision, please just indicate to one of us. And we'll gladly lead you to the Savior. Amen.
We are Burnham Community Church. You'll find us in Somerset, just five minutes from the M5 Junction 22. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10.30 in the St. John's Ambulance Hall in Highbridge. Watch our website or follow us on Facebook and look out for our banner. Come along and check us out.